Today's presentation is on the glorious revolution that occurred in England. Uh, note that this is not similar to many of the other revolutions you might have heard of before in history. Unlike, say, the American Revolution or the French Revolution, or even the Russian Revolution, those were some examples that were mentioned in class, the Glorious Revolution is slightly different, uh, being that instead of calling it the English Revolution, they call it the Glorious Revolution. We'll be talking about its significance. So at this time, um, Europe, um, England and the rest of Europe are trying to answer the question of what is the nature of government power, how much power should a king have, how much power should the people have, where does power come from? And there are a lot of different ways of answering this question. If you study, if you ever become a political science major, you will definitely pick up all of these books and discuss this thoroughly. Uh, in short, there are people on one side who argue for the divine right of kings, saying that kings only answer to God because they get absolute power from God. These people say that kings don't answer to any earthly power. They definitely don't have to answer to the people. They have absolute power, and there's nothing people can do about that. There are some people in the middle, however. I'm not going to say it's all one side or the other. There's people like Thomas Hobbes uh, who are in the middle. By the way, if you ever become a political science major, you will definitely be reading that book. Um, Thomas Hobbes believes in a social contract, saying uh, kings don't necessarily get their power directly from God, but they get it from a social contract, but there's no right of people to revolt against a king. So there are some people in the middle who say oh, there's kind of some limits and People aren't absolute, but you're not allowed to revolt against the king. And on the other side, you have uh, people who say social contract, the social contract exists, and people have a right to revolt against government uh, when they become abusive. We're going to be seeing those ideas a lot more again in chapters 15 and 16. Uh, we'll definitely be talking about John Locke in chapter 15. So, after Cromwell's death, his son Richard allowed Parliament to reconvene. During all this time, uh, during the Protectorate era, we talked about the Protectorate on Friday, during the time of the Protectorate, Oliver Cromwell essentially ruled as a, a king in everything but name. And he didn't necessarily even need Parliament to run things. He only had a few people running England with him. Uh, when Parliament reconvened, uh, Parliament decided to restore the Stuart monarchy. They decided that uh, Parliament decided they had enough of the protectorate and they wanted their king back. So in 1660, England had a new king whose name was Charles II. Uh, this reestablishment of the Stuart monarchy is called the Restoration. So the key piece of information about Charles II, the restoration of the Stuart monarchy in England. Uh, to make things a little bit smoother, in 1679, Parliament again passed the Habeas Corpus Act, which made it illegal for the government to arbitrarily hold someone in jail. So the result of this act uh, was a bit of a compromise, saying that uh, the king or anyone else in government is not allowed to imprison people without a reason. Um, the right to habeas corpus that Americans have from the uh, American Bill of Rights, well, guess where some of the inspiration for that idea came from? The Habeas Corpus Act, meaning government can't imprison you without a reason. So we come to the restoration of Charles II. The key piece of information about English King Charles II is the restoration of the Stuart dynasty. For about 11 years, England has had zero kings. Uh, ever since they uh, executed Charles I, they've been experimenting with republicanism, republican with a little case, lowercase r. But they decided they'd had enough of that, and so they restored the monarchy. They wanted their king back. And fortunately for everyone, Charles II didn't really come into conflict with Parliament. And he only punished the people who were responsible for his death. Now, there was like a, a few dozen people who signed Charles I's death warrant, and so he had them tortured to death. But everyone else in Parliament, everyone else in the government, essentially was let off with uh, almost no punishment. Uh, absolutism would be defeated in England. Although Charles II's power was limited, he did his best to remain financially independent of Parliament. So he didn't necessarily fight Parliament, but he wasn't a friend of Parliament either. Since Charles II had no legitimate children, he was succeeded by his brother, James II. James was an ardent Roman Catholic and a firm believer in absolutism. So two ideas that James II had that were uh, not so popular with Parliament, 
he was getting on the wrong side of Parliament. Members of Parliament feared that absolutism would be re-established in, in England, and they also feared that England would be forced back into the fold of the Roman Catholic Church. So those two main ideas that James II had, he believed in absolutism, and he also was a Catholic. Those are two strikes against him. Uh, the final strike would come in June 1688, when the leaders of Parliament invited William of Orange, the leader of the Protestant Netherlands, and the husband of uh, James II's daughter, Mary, to come to England and rule as a limited monarch. So at this time, uh, during the rule of Charles II and James II, um, you have political parties emerging in England. In fact, uh, just about all political parties uh, that emerged in the English-speaking world have some sort of origin in one of these two groups. You've got the Whigs on one side and the Tories on the other. Let me uh, break down this cartoon for you. You've got uh, a ki the king in the middle and the nature of the crown, the nature of government power. Over here, you've, this, is a Jesuit, uh, this is a Jesuit monk. That's one of the ways they would dress. And so uh, you have the uh, pro-Catholic, pro-monarch Tories uh, pulling on that side of the, the crown, you have the anti-Catholic uh, monarch limiting Whigs on this side of the crown, and both the Tories and the Whigs are fighting over this issue of how much power should the government have. Almost all political parties in the English-speaking world uh, have their origins in this, because these were the first uh, political parties in the English-speaking world. Um, two main ideas about both of these parties. Uh, the Tories essentially were loyal to the monarchy, even though they are Catholic, uh, meaning even though the monarchy is Catholic. Uh, the Tories aren't Catholics, they prefer Protestantism, but if the monarch is Catholic, they don't really care. The Tories are loyal to the monarchy. Don't confuse that. Uh, on the other hand, you have the Whigs. has nothing to do with the article of clothing. It has to do with a, a nickname that a rebellious group of Scots was given. Uh, the main idea of the Whigs is that monarchy should be limited. The main idea of the Whigs is that monarchy should be limited. And also, they wanted to disqualify all Catholics uh, from the inheritance of the English throne. Uh, there are two matching questions. There's a set of two matching questions. This, these two could be one of them. won't make this fill in the blank, but this could be one of the uh, multiple choice questions. Do not confuse these two. Uh, everything you need to know about these two parties is here. Some call that philosophy the Whig Revolution. So, um, getting to the issue of James II, there's a key question. Um, and we will see this question again in chapter 16 with the American Revolution. Is it possible for a king to unking himself by his actions? Can a king be so bad that the people have a right to overthrow him? Well, understandably, the Tories would say no, but the Whigs said yes. The Whigs claimed that James II broke the social contract, meaning they have reason to fire him, for lack of a better word. So the Whigs claimed James II broke the social contract, so they have a right to fire him and replace him with another person. Uh, there's a lot of ideas uh, being uh, presented by the Whigs. I've read these books. Uh, uh, this is uh, one Whig philosopher uh, that I read that you don't have to. We will be talking about John Locke's book. Uh, his second treatise of government is a must read if you become a political scientist. We'll discuss John Locke more in chapter 15. But the basic idea is that uh, it, he is arguing for a limited monarchy. He's arguing for the social contract. And he's arguing that the king is not above the law. In fact, there's an amusing point where uh, this guy says that uh, in 1 Samuel, when Samuel appoints Saul as king, he sees that as punishment. He sees the kings of Israel as punishment for Israel's obedience, and that absolute monarchs are not established by God. They were actually part of God's punishment. But that's a story for another time. So, in Europe... Um, You've got James II, and he has to choose between two different ideas of running Europe. On one side, you have Louis XIV, the epitome of absolutism. Uh, France is Catholic, and of course, Louis XIV is an absolute monarch, and he is setting an example for other monarchs to copy. And so uh, 
Europe, European countries have to decide, are they going to be uh, a little bit more limited monarchies or absolute monarchies? On the other side of Louis XIV, uh, the guy who's leading the anti-Louis XIV coalition is William III of Orange, who is very Protestant, obviously, and he actually runs a federal republic, where even though he's kind of like a king, he does not have absolute power, and the uh, Netherlands, the country of the Netherlands, is technically a republic at this time. It's not a monarchy. It is a republic with uh, restraints on government. So you've got these two different ideas about how Europe should be. Understandably, Louis XIV is the most powerful. And unfortunately for James II, he starts to lean in the direction of Louis XIV. He is Catholic, and he also wants to be an absolute monarch. This is a mistake for James II because Parliament will use these as grounds for firing James II. So here's what you need to know about James II. Uh, I'll explain these words in a moment. He used royal prerogative to raise taxes and enact laws. Now that means he made his own laws without Parliament. He made up his own laws by his own authority. Okay, That's what it means, royal prerogative. James II was creating laws on his own. Now, I'm not going to say he was a bad person. In fact, in his defense, the laws that he was creating out of his own power were relatively reasonable. The laws he was creating actually uh, were enforcing uh, religious toleration. So I'm not going to say he was an absolute despot. Uh, there were worse kings of England than him. However, there's one key problem with what he did, which opens like a Pandora's box for future problems, even if these laws are pretty decent laws. The fact that he made them without parliament means that he's going to be an absolute monarch someday. The fact that he can write laws without parliament means parliament has no ability to restrain him. And so that is a problem for parliament, and that's one I can understand. Parliament invited William and Mary to take over. Uh, when they landed with the Dutch army, James II fled to France and fled to King Louis XIV. And people would say that counts as an abdication. He gave up the job. James II would later come back and say, wait, no, I didn't give up the job. I just ran away. Well, um, in any case, he's going to get himself fired by Parliament. So I'm really sorry that there's a bunch of Jameses and Cromwells and, and Charleses, but I made this chart, and I'll be posting this to the review as well. I made this chart to help you keep uh, the Stuart monarchs uh, straight. So you have James I. Um, what we learned about him in previous chapters, the key thing in uh, chapter 14, James, this James is James two numbers, because remember, he has two numbers because he's the sixth king sixth James of Scotland. He was the king of Scotland before he was the king of England, but he's the first James in England. So James, two numbers. That's what you're associating with this first James. Then you have Charles I. What happened to Charles I? Well, um, he became too, he ruled a little bit too much like a tyrant, and he suffered terminal head from neck syndrome. Charles I was tried and beheaded. So with no more kings, we have Cromwell and the Protectorate. So that's what you're associating with Cromwell. We talked about the Protectorate on Friday. You have James two numbers. Charles I was tried and beheaded. Cromwell led the Protectorate. Then we go back in this opposite order. Uh, Cromwell's son, Richard Cromwell, didn't even keep the job for two months before England wanted their king back. So he's not even mentioned in the textbook, uh, or emboldened in the textbook. What you need to know about Charles II? The Restoration. Charles II was restored to the monarchy. James two numbers, Charles I tried and beheaded, Cromwell led the protectorate, Charles II uh, was part of the restoration of the monarchy, and James II was fired by Parliament. So that's how you keep these names straight. James Charles Cromwell, Cromwell Charles James. Two numbers, tried and beheaded, protectorate, restoration, fired by Parliament. England had undergone a bloodless, relatively bloodless, Glorious Revolution. That's one of the reasons they call it a Glorious Revolution. Uh, William and Mary didn't necessarily have to kill anyone in England to take over the throne. They were essentially invited by Parliament to take over. And so William and Mary would uh, rule as joint uh, rulers of England. They were both king and queen at the same time. It's kind of weird how it worked out. Parliament drew up a list of conditions called the Bill of Rights. Believe it or not, England had a Bill of Rights more than 100 years before America had one. 
This Bill of Rights limited royal power, that's the first thing. It established civil liberties, so it gave and guaranteed freedoms. And a third thing was that it forbade future rulers, uh, future kings or queens from being Roman Catholics. So it prevented any Roman Catholic from being the English monarch. So those are the three things that the Bill of Rights did. Um, one other thing that would probably be the final nail in the coffin for absolutism in, in England. In 1701, Parliament passed the Act of Settlement which gave Parliament the right to grant the throne to whomever it wished. So essentially, what does the Act of Settlement do? Uh, it gives Parliament the right to pick the king. I if that doesn't limit the power of the king, I don't know what does. So probably the Act of Settlement uh, pretty much guaranteed, uh, th these two guaranteed that England would never be absolutist. And there was no way, there was no way that the uh, monarchy could become absolutist after that. And if in my opinion, it kept on moving in the right direction of limited government. So we come to the glorious revolution. That term is emboldened in, in your textbook. I could ask you about that on the quiz. Some historians call the glorious revolution the first modern revolution, where you've got a bunch of people leading an army, and they uh, lead this army against uh, a king. They replace the king with their own people and start some new rules. However, this uh, revolution is going to be different than some of the revolutions that follow. Because uh, future revolutions throughout history are just going to use force to create new rules. Uh, people, you have two sides with guns and swords, and the, guy, and the side with the most sun, guns and swords wins. And they take over and make some new rules, and they change things. That wasn't the point of the Glorious Revolution, though. Here is what makes the Glorious Revolution glorious. It's the fact that they didn't create any new rules. The Glorious Revolution and the Bill of Rights didn't create any new, new rights. They just restored old rights that Englishmen had held for generations. So the Bill of Rights didn't necessarily write anything completely new or completely unheard of. The Bill of Rights was merely the king and parliament, the king and queen of parliament, recognizing that English, English people had had these rights all along for generations, and that there was nothing that kings or queens or parliaments could do to take those rights away. Um, we'll be talking more about Edmund Burke. Uh, he was a British politician who wrote about the French Revolution. That's some chapter 16 stuff. Uh, essentially, what Edmund Burke said was that uh, the, rep the Glorious Revolution didn't really create anything new. It was just reaffirming the old rights that Englishmen had. And the idea of creating a brand new government, that's the, the Glorious Revolution in England and the French Revolution a hundred years later would have almost nothing to do with each other. The Glorious Revolution preserved old rights. The French Revolution, however, tried to destroy the old system and just rewrite everything from scratch. The English Revolution and the French Revolution could not be more opposite. So, here is the significance of the English Bill of Rights. Yes, it uh, limited the king and guaranteed some liberties, but here is its significance to chapter 14. If I were to ask you on the quiz, what is the significance of the English Bill of Rights? Well, here is how you explain why it's so important. In the English Bill of Rights, both Parliament and the new monarchs, William and Mary, guaranteed that England would be a constitutional monarchy. At this point, Parliament and both the King and Queen of England are promising that England is going to be a constitutional monarchy. And this pretty much guarantees that England is never going to be absolutist. From this point, England uh, looks away from absolutism and never looks back. It never looks back. A side note, as part of the definition, in addition to guaranteeing rights and limiting the king, it also prevented Catholics from being monarchs in the future. But that's not as important as this guarantee. Uh, see if you can see some wording that's familiar to you. Uh, tax, no, that living money is taxes. Uh, no taxation without the consent of parliament. No taxation without representation. Does that sound familiar? Uh, freedom of election. Does that sound familiar? Uh, no illegal and cruel punishments. Uh, no cruel and unusual punishments. Does that sound familiar? Or how about... Um, um, Rule by the consent of the governed. Does that sound familiar? Uh, the right of subjects 
to the right of subjects to petition the king for a redress of grievances. Uh, the right of assembly and petition for a redress of grievances, does that sound familiar? Uh, freedom of speech, does that sound familiar? Um, rights and liberties of this are indubitable rights. Uh, inalienable rights, that's actually uh, from the Declaration of Independence. But do all, do all these ideas sound familiar? If they do, it just goes to show you how important the English Bill of Rights was. Because the American Revolution didn't necessarily recreate a lot of government systems. And the American Revolution was mainly not about creating a new government, but trying to reaffirm the rights of Englishmen that the English people had had for hundreds of years already. So, um, all of these terms have been emboldened throughout the textbook, so I'm within my rights to ask about them. Um, I consider these three documents to be incredibly important in history. The three great charters of liberty. Uh, why do we have constitutional limited government? It's really because of these three documents, even more than the documents of the American Revolution and the American Constitution. Uh, do you remember the Magna Carta from chapter 9 that put limits on the power of the king? Uh, the Petition of Right, we talked about that on Friday, uh, demanding no taxation without the consent of Parliament, and also demanding habeas corpus, demanding that uh, government can't imprison people without a reason. And finally, you have the English Bill of Rights, which guarantees that England is going to be a constitutional monarchy. I personally am telling you, these are important for the quiz, and these are the three most important documents in the history of constitutional limited government. If you care about constitutional government, you need to study these three documents. So we come to the rule of William and Mary, whom the College of William and Mary happened to be named after. So the key thing you're remembering about Mary and William is that they promised to rule as a limited monarch, as opposed to an absolute monarch, which is unlimited. Uh, she would, however, spend much of her reign fighting against uh, Louis XIV and her younger brother. And in the same idea, William, William III promised to live as a, uh, to rule and live as a limited monarch. And it's also worth noting that he led the, co the anti-Louis XIV coalition in Europe. He's the one who organized nations in Europe so that they could put a stop to Louis XIV uh, during these wars that we're going to learn about tomorrow. After the reign of Mary's sister, Queen Anne, uh, both uh, Mary and Anne would die without an heir, uh, the throne eventually passed to a German. They had to look uh, for the closest living Protestant relative, and the closest living Protestant relative was actually not close at all. He lived in Germany. So George of Hanover, who was a descendant of the first James, James II numbers, took over. And because George of Hanover did not speak English, he couldn't run government, even if he wanted to. Uh, so he had to ask others to make the decisions of government for him. These people, his closest advisors, are called a cab cabinet government. Uh, did you know that uh, the president of the United States, his closest advisors, is considered part of his cabinet? I wonder where America gets that term cabinet from. It's from England. These most important advisors to the executive who are making a lot of choices in government, that's where that comes from. The fact that the German George I of Hanover needed help running his government, so he asked the elected officials of government to help him run it for him. Uh, you also have the emergence of the first prime minister of England, and so finally it is elected people, not necessarily the, the monarch, who are making the decisions of government. Um, just a brief word about Anne, because she's not as emphasized in the textbook. Um, she is responsible for the Act of Union in 1707, where the monarchy of England and the monarchy, the Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of Ireland, they technically all became merged into one kingdom, what's called the United Kingdom of Great Britain. So there's no more kings or queens of just England now. From this slide onward, I'm going to refer to this place as Britain, uh, as long as I can rem remember it. She is responsible for the creation of the United Kingdom. It's also worth noting, uh, while I probably won't ask this on the quiz, I find this really neat. Anne is the last 
British English monarch to use royal veto power in Britain. She used it in 1708. Keep in mind, veto means the ability of an executive to negate a law just by their own de declaration. She was the last English or British monarch to ever use the veto power, and for the last 300 years, not a single monarch of Britain has used veto power. That's some restraint. That's some self-limitation. Anne would, however, die uh, without an heir, so uh, Parliament had to look to Germany to find the nearest Protestant heir. So, um, so here's how that worked. Uh, William and Mary both died without an heir, so it went to the younger sister, Anne. Anne also would die without an heir. Now, they both had the Catholic brother who was stylizing himself as James III. He was trying to be the James III, but he didn't really have much power. Parliament disqualified this person. Parliament disqualified uh, Anne's brother and Mary's brother because they said he was Catholic. Remember, the Whigs want to disqualify anyone who's Catholic from inheriting the throne. And so instead of going to this nearest relative, they had to find the next closest relative, and that person happened to live in Germany. That would be Sophia of Hanover. They declare this uh, Protestant relative to, like, with the act of settlement, uh, Parliament picks the next queen. They pick Sophia of Hanover. And we came really close to having a Queen Sophia of Britain, but she died just a few months before Anne did, so the throne technically went all the way to Sophia's son, George I of Hanover. And that's essentially what started this new dynasty. That's what established the cabinet government, because George I only spoke German, and so he needed the prime minister and the cabinet to run the nation. So England is even, even though England is guaranteed to not be an absolute monarch, they're still moving in the direction of limited government. I like that. Although all of the Hanover's dynasty had to deal with the fact that uh, the descendants of that original James II, his descendants still claimed the throne, and they had people who were following them, that was always an issue for the House of Hanover. We'll be talking a lot more about uh, George III during chapter 16. And there was also this nice video that we watched.